This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning John Rubino, well-known author and publisher of website DollarCollapse.com and the co-author of the most recent book, The Money Bubble. Uh, good morning, John. Morning, Gord. I wanted to remind our, our listeners that uh, we actually did a tape here last month on your book. Uh, how are sales? Anything that you can report on the book? Sales are good. Yeah, we're, we're very pleased so far. Um, now now we're uh, into the uh, the stage of selling foreign rights for uh, foreign language editions. So um, that's the the big news this month. If we can get a you know French and German and, and Russian version out there, that'll be very helpful. We're going to talk about a four part series that you just had out that you've been publishing on what will blow up next. And you've talked about Europe, Japan, subprime countries, and China. But your book also also talks about this. Oh yeah, the book um, has chapters on basically what could go wrong. You know, we, we sketch out a lot of scenarios and uh, uh, among them are certain trouble spots around the world blowing up first and taking down the rest of the uh, the, the global financial system. And I, I think that that kind of resonates in the sound money community because I think most people who um, are, are focused on gold and monetary policy and, and things like that um, basically understand that we're heading off a cliff. And so ha- have have stopped really thinking about whether that's true and, and uh, turn their attention to what's going to do it, you know, what's going to blow up first. So I did a series of um, articles on dollarcollapse.com that look at uh, some likely suspects. And there's Europe and Japan and the emerging markets and China, and all of which <laughs> have, have really fundamental, very serious problems that could um, bite them and then metastasize to the rest of the global financial system. Without question. Matter of fact, that list is short. I could add more names to it. One right off the bat is the United States. It's a given that we, we could be the catalyst because we're, we're uh, right up there among the, the most badly run systems in the world. Well, I would argue that we're at the core of the problem, but uh, that's another show. And that goes back to the U.S. dollar and the reserve currency in a fiat-based uh, global system is really a core root and also when you drive an economy where you're consuming more than you're producing and financing that over a sustained period of time, which creates the global imbalances that uh, that we have. But anyway, John, so we don't run out of time because we always, we always do. Let's just jump right into it. Let's start with Europe. Europe is uh, one of the, the few places in the world, few major places, where the, the central bank is running relatively tight monetary policy. Uh, that, that's very unusual out there, and it's it's to their credit that they're doing that because that's how a, a central bank should operate. You know, money should be fairly tight, loans should be fairly hard to get, and and um, credit should be extended for productive purposes only in a well-run system. The problem is um, Europe has built up so much debt and has uh, such a horrendous uh, list of labor laws and other kinds of regulations that the, the system is really sclerotic. It, it doesn't function very well. And in a, a tight money situation, um, a, a lot of the peripheral countries just can't manage. So you've got um, overall Eurozone inflation near zero, possibly heading into a deflation this year. You've got Greek unemployment at 28% and rising, and a new bailout is coming. Uh, Spain's non-performing bank loans are at an all-time high, and the Italian government just fell and was replaced by people who really don't have any answers either. So it, it looks like a, a return to recession is imminent in Europe. And that, that's coming at a time of extremely high unemployment and, you know, 60% youth unemployment in several countries. And, and so that means civil unrest is fairly likely. Um, the election of anti-Euro parties in, in Greece and France and elsewhere is also possible. And, and so you could see um, a dissolution of the Eurozone in the next couple of years uh, based on what's happening now. And that would be catastrophic for the global financial system because um, so much debt is denominated in euros, but would flow back to the originating country if you saw, say, Italy 
leave the eurozone and adopt the readopt the lira and then devalue the lira dramatically that makes the the debt that uh, used to be in euros and is now in lira much less valuable and so the big banks that have lent a lot of money to Italy would then have to take massive losses and uh, their solvency would be questionable. And you'd see that reverberate through the global financial system. So that's that's one possible trigger to a global financial crisis. And they see it coming. And I say that the whole discussion is coming out of the ECB and the various countries. And, and just last week, the Bundesbank, for the very first time, has now supported suspending ECB's, uh, you know, four-year policy of draining funds from the Eurozone banks to offset the, the ECB's bond buying, which was about sterilization, which means they're not going to be sterilizing. That means they're really clearing it to have a European quantitative easing. Oh, they, they have no choice but to go to that pretty soon because uh, the, the alternative is a, a crisis that, that I just described or maybe much more serious. The, the next chart actually shows the difference in, in central bank um, asset purchases over the last few years. And you can see that the U.S. has uh, has more than doubled the size of its balance sheet. And uh, the Bank of Japan has nearly doubled its. And meanwhile, the, the ECB is down by 40%. Uh, that's a measure of how much money they're pumping into the system. And you can see the U.S. is very easy, Japan is fairly easy, and, and Europe is fairly tight. And those differences can't survive in a world where everybody is grossly over-indebted. I'm on record a number of shows saying that it was now ECB's or Europe's turn at this ring around the rosy to increase the liquidity pumping. And in spite of the legal issues that they face, and now they're just knocking those down. And Germany clearly believes that something's got to be done and, and, and done fast because you have what I've referred to as the currency cartel, and that is the, the euro, the yen, the dollar, and the pound controlling 90% of the world's currency. So as long as they debase in a coordinated fashion, people currently have little place to run, um, sort of, and that's why you see this huge disparity between that group and what we often call the emerging markets or the developing world who are not in that, <laughs> uh, who are the recipients of the cartel. But, you know, I was just reading that France, uh, example, where it works from the peripheral to the core, UK Telegraph, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, a very conservative, very thoughtful economist. He says, France is, and I'll quote him, looking down the barrel of a deflation shock. And because the French prices uh, month over month were, are negative right now, the uh, manufacturing goods, negative 3%, clothing, negative 15.4%, I can go on. It's hitting in a wave. They're running and they're running scared. If they don't, as you said, there's a recession coming in Europe. And remembering, for those that aren't familiar, we just had six quarters of recession. Out one quarter, which means did we really ever leave? Yeah. And now, oh, there are three or four good points in, in what you just said that we should expand on. One is that... Um, Deflation is actually the normal state of a healthy economy because as, as, um, capital and, and labor get more productive, it costs less to make stuff. So their prices should normally go down, but you can't have deflation in a, a system with too much debt because that makes debts harder to manage. And so you, you make the system very unstable. And that's what Europe is looking at right now. Extreme instability, which is going to lead to, um, you know, the, gov the major governments panicking and opening the floodgates and forcing the European Central Bank to adopt quantitative easing um, in ways that the U.S. and Japan have already done. John, the other wild card in this is uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, the economies are slowing, the GDPs are slowing, and they're all indebted very heavily to European banks, which are highly leveraged. So the non-performing loans that are increasing there. So these are all cascading all at once. So anything could blow up at any given moment in Europe. Japan. Japan is it's a pretty well-known story by now, but the, the consequences are still so serious that we, we have to come back to it every once in a while. They're basically, they've been running huge public sector deficits for decades now, and they've accumulated more debt as a percent of GDP, around 220%. Than, than any other major country and maybe more than any country ever. And in 2013, they decided to inflate their way out of it. And they, they forced the Bank of Japan to uh, engineer an inflation rate of at least 2% via a really aggressive expansion of its balance sheet. Uh, unfortunately, it's not really working. Uh, Jap Japanese growth is slowing and its trade deficit has just exploded lately. Um, and even so, you know, even after a, a year of aggressive quantitative easing, 43% of the, the current budget still has to be borrowed. 
and debt service is going to consume a quarter of the federal budget. You know, th these are numbers that are just so far out of the range of even today's normal. You know, the, the Euro Europe and, and the U.S. don't have anything like this going on. Um, and so Japan is really a currency crisis waiting to happen because they've got everything stacked against them right now. They, they owe absolutely insane amounts of money. Their economy is slowing down. Their demographics are uh, or horrendous. You know, they've got a, the, the most rapidly aging population in the world. And because they're running trade deficits now, they have to finance more and more of their their increasing debt load externally. They've got to borrow that money on the open market. And the, the global financial system is going to demand interest rates at least comparable to the U.S. and Germany, which is maybe twice what Japan now pays. So they're going to have to roll over their maturing debt at higher and higher interest rates in the future, which is just going to explode their the, the interest costs component of their budget deficit. They can't manage the payments now effectively. No. And if they were to achieve 2% inflation, which is their goal, we can guess that the bonds are going to have to be more than the 2%. Would we agree with that? They're not only broke, success becomes failure. And right yeah. now they're even failing at trying to get that inflation, though it has been starting to, to squeak up. And now they've implemented policies where they're increasing the tax to the citizens as this aging population and less work um, is, is available. John, I don't see any, any way out of this until there's no. a crisis and a collapse here. Of, of some sort. This illustrates what, your, your lack of choices once you borrow too much money because there's nothing you can do that fixes it. There's only uh, uh, you can screw up in one direction or the other direction and uh, and have one kind of pain or another kind of pain, but you cannot fix it painlessly. The next chart actually uh, illustrates the uh, the extremity of Japan's position right now because their sovereign debt as a percent of tax revenue dwarfs that of even the other really badly run countries. You know, it's worse than Greece, worse than Italy, worse than the United States. And and uh, these other countries have debt situations that are probably going to destroy them at some point in the future. But Japan's, at least at the the federal government level, is so much more extreme than than even what we have here in the U.S. That uh, that it's easy to see the market figuring this out all at once. You know, all market participants deciding that finally Japan is is ready to go and then heading for the exits at once and then uh, the system just imploding. We can't know when that's going to be. It should have happened already. I've been on record here for oh, at least a couple of years saying that I believe that the crisis would come out of Japan, that that would be the centric spot. And part of the issue, besides all these things we're talking about, John, is that the global the globe is so dependent now on the Japanese carry trade of a flowing capital as they, as they just print end, endlessly. But if you look at the R squared fit of the, the euro yen cross and map it to the S and P, it's, it's just a perfect R squared. I mean, you can tell the, where the, where the futures markets and the opening gap is going to be in the morning just by looking at that cross and which is, which is telling you where the, where the credit is being, uh, being created. I don't think most of our listeners fully appreciate the, the amount of debt that Japan has accumulated over the last 20 years. Emerging markets, John, another problem. Yeah, well, uh, emerging markets, that, that's a nice segue from uh, the, the yen carry trade, by the way, because that's uh, a, a big part of the emerging market problem. Basically, the, uh, the developed world has been um, creating huge amounts of new currency in order to deal with their debt problems stemming from their own mismanagement. And a lot of that money uh, flows into the emerging markets. You know, governments in, in the West can create a lot of currency, but they can't dictate where it goes. And so um, a lot of it has been flowing into Brazil and India and Thailand and China. And um, that's, in, in the initial stages, been a mixed blessing for these countries because it bids up asset prices and stock prices and, and makes it easy to borrow. But it also raises the cost of living, which makes life harder for voters. So that it's, it's mildly destabilizing when the money's flowing in. But when the money flows back out, it's, it's pure chaos. And that's what's happening to the developing world right now. They're, they're seeing the hot money that flowed in over the last three years flow back out. And, and they've got all these um, artificially inflated asset prices, which cannot be sustained without new inflows of money. And uh, now you've got outflows. So the, the asset prices in a lot of these countries, you know, that's real estate, equities, um, government bonds, all, all of these things are crashing. 
and it's all happening at once. And that leaves the um, the emerging market governments and central banks with very few good options. And so uh, what they're having to do is raise interest rates dramatically and impose capital controls as a way of, of managing in the short run. But the, those are policies that have really bad long-term effects. So, you know, lately Brazil raised their uh, overnight lending rate to 10.5%, yeah, which is what um, – 10.25% higher than what the U.S. has. It's a huge disparity. And um, Turkey went even further. They, they on one day in January, raised their overnight lending rate from 7 and change to, to something like 12.5%. And these are rates that, in this world, are um, highly destabilizing for an emerging market. You know, that basically guarantees a recession in the following year when you have interest rates that high. And that's all these guys can do. They can't really control their their destiny because they're at the mercy of the uh, the central banks and the general monetary mismanagement of the developed world. And so, in the year ahead, um, it, it's almost a, a what blows up first kind of story in, in microcosm, in which maybe it's Turkey, maybe it's Thailand, maybe Brazil, India. Who knows? But uh, it, it's very possible that one or more um, major developing countries blow up and uh, and take down the rest of that sector. Because if, if one goes, it terrifies the, the global financial markets vis-a-vis -vis the others. You know, nobody's going to want to invest in Thailand if India has a, a major financial crisis. And again, the Western central banks, the developed world central banks, have lent so much money to the, the developing world that for a few of them to go, um, that creates huge income statement and balance sheet problems for the um, the major banks of Europe and Japan and the U.S. So uh, a, a developing world crisis would spread to the developed world in a heartbeat. You know, this is a, a one-week story if it happens where uh, uh, trouble in India, Brazil spreads to, to New York and London um, at Internet time. That's exactly what I think, John, we're going to see, whether it's somewhere in the Fragile Five, part of the BRICS, um, that that's going to implode because this fast money that's exiting, the slowing total global aggregate demand that's being burdened on them is putting all these countries into a very negative current account payment issue and problem. They're addressing it, trying to with interest, capital controls, but now they got social problems and inflation, which we're effectively exporting to these countries, is now showing up in the food prices. Food prices are climbing at significant rates, and in these parts of the world, food is a larger part of their disposable income that's used for it. So any kind of movement there, you have major social unrest. And all these countries, most of them are facing major elections right now. So I think, you know, at this G20 meeting, uh, Yellen's going to be her first one there as the chairperson of the Federal Reserve. Like the last one in St. Petersburg to the, to Bernanke, she is going to have her ear burnt off by the G20 countries on taper because the crisis has really sprung since we started the taper process because it slowed the rate of hot money into these countries. It's not the solution, but like Japan, they're just trying to buy more time. That's really the end game here, um, that, that the U.S. is going to have to take back its tapering and, and probably increase quantitative easing sometime in the next year to um, 100 billion a month or 120 billion a month or whatever, because it's going to have so many crises around the world that it has to deal with that uh, it, it can't contribute to the problem by tightening at that point. Sean, I do a lot of work in that regard and specifically with uh, Richard Duncan and in tracking the liquidity and liquidity flows. And Richard's numbers are very, very clear. There's lots of liquidity with taper through to about uh, May or June. And then in the second half, we have a significant liquidity problem, liquidity squeeze. And he believes and he can show that it needs to be an increase of $500 billion to a $1 trillion has got to be inserted sometime between now and the end of the year without a crisis or we're going to have a crisis or the U.S. will be in a major recession. This is just straight arithmetic. And that's just the U.S. You know, let something else blow up out there that uh, spreads to the rest of the world, and, and it happens sooner. You know, it, it could happen next week if we see a, a major um, developing world crisis. This is why I think uh, Europe is pushing so hard to move to quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. It's got to be the global pump here in the short term. What about China, John? We are breaking this session at this point, and we'll continue on tape number two. We have a very large audio and iTunes listener base who have requested that the sessions be kept to approximately 20 minutes in duration. We'll be right back.
This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.